Okay, well, we'll move forward. Um, today, we're going to be doing a deep dive into the uh, Community Waiver Program Services. Dr. Lisa Mills, our subject matter expert, is going to lead us in that. I want to also thank Byron White for being here in case we have questions about employment services. Uh, but first, we're going to get started. Harrison's going to go over some, uh, just some brief updates on our request for proposal. Okay, so we have had uh, three RFPs that were sent out for the community waiver program. They were all sent out within a few days of each other, so they're all in the same state. Um, the first one was for direct service professionals training. Uh, a provider has been selected, so we are moving forward on that. I can't announce any providers until, of course, that's been approved through our contracting office. Um, but you know, U.S. providers, one of the things that you asked us for was to look at ways to have a consolidated training program, and you asked that the department look at paying for some of that training, so that's what the department is doing. Um, the trainings that are in, um, that are required of direct service professionals, we will be providing uh, with the exception of CPR and first aid and safety. The training coordination RFP has also been selected. And this is the RFP where we will be bringing in subject matter experts as we identify gaps in training or other areas where we think there needs to be additional training. And then the last waiver was for, the last, excuse me, um, RFP was for an independent evaluator. That um, organization has been selected. And as soon as those contracts are approved, then we can announce them. Um, but I can tell you that we will have a very robust independent evaluator. Um, that evaluator will be examining all aspects of the community waiver program. Uh, the evaluator will also have to look at the specifics that CMS has asked um, for us to evaluate. So those, all three have been selected and we are in the process of getting those contracts signed. Thank you. Okay. With that, we'll turn it over to Lisa Mills to start talking about our services. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, I think we wanted to stop here and um, ask if there were any general questions or um, updates you'd like to have that we haven't provided uh, before we dive into the employment services because I want to, um, I'm encouraging all providers to stay on and learn about how we're going to deliver employment services. But if you are a provider agency that is not going to be contracted to provide employment services, you may, you know, you obviously have the option to um, leave early. But before we get into employment services and anybody disappears, we wanted to just um, ask if there are any questions you all have um, about current status of the program or anything like that that you'd want to you'd want to discuss now. Hey, good morning. Uh, it's Deanna. I do have a question. Um, on the training, you know, I realize, uh, Harrison, that, that you can't, that you guys are in the process of contracting with, with the vendor, um, but I mean, do you have a timeline? It's just, if we're looking at starting services in January, being able to, to get our, all of our staff through all that training is, you know, it's gonna take some time. I mean, uh, right, will the training be available? The, right now we're looking at having the training available in December. Um, I can't give you an exact date as of yet, um, I probably will be able to in a few weeks, um, but as soon as I know that I will, I will get that out with you. Um, we kind of had some discussions with Terry about trying to, you know, get that information out as soon as possible so that providers can um, better be ready to uh, get that done. And this is Susan from People First. We have been approved to do two new services, so my question is, since they're new, um, the training, uh, especially hiring consultants and all that kind of stuff, so we're, we're still in that pool of 
of December for beginning that training coordination? Um, I can't really tell you exactly the date on that because that depends on what those trainings are. Um, we will have the training coordinators, um, you know, we'll be working with them at that point, but that depends on really who's selected to be that expert and how quickly we can get them in. Um, but what I would suggest to you, Susan, is um, if you have really some specific training things that you think need to be put in, to email us and let us know so that, you know, so that we can kind of discuss that with them up front. Okay, that's great. That's, I definitely do, okay? Okay, thank All you. Right. We appreciate it, thank you. You're welcome. Um, Harrison, this is Vicki Turnage, and I would just like to um, piggyback on what uh, Susan just said, especially in relation to, to the peer, su uh, peer support. Um, I would definitely recommend that those experts are self-advocates who are doing the training and not somebody else. So that's my comment. Okay, thank you. And I'll be so glad I to recommend some people that could do that. In the meantime, I, I have time in my contract to assist. So um, to the extent you're looking for assistance before that um, contract gets put in place, please reach out. I'm happy to share, you know, assist because uh, that is part of the scope of my contract. It's, I can't do it all, which is why we have the separate, you know, training initiative and I'm, I'm not the best SME for everything, but I, I've seen these services working in other states so I could share. Um, share that information. Yeah, that's what we're looking for. Thank you, Vicki and, and Lisa. Thank you. And I think, Harrison, we're hoping that once the DSP training vendor is notified and you can share that with people, that we could have them join one of these um, upcoming sessions um, so they can give you an overview of that, that how they, that, that whole system of training that they have? We'll, we'll do that, but that will probably be another training um, because I'm pretty sure we can't pull that together for next week. But yeah, we will have um, an opportunity for them to be able to do that. Yeah. Okay, uh, any other comments, questions at this point? Okay, well, again, I'm going to encourage everybody to stay on and learn about how we're going to do employment services, but I recognize if you are an agency who's not going to be contracting for this, and you're not a support coordination agency that's going to be authorizing this, then if you, uh, you know, don't want to hang around, that's okay. This will be recorded and the resources will be here. Um, but we thought we'd start with um, an overview of the employment services Part of the reason is we're looking at which of the services do we expect will be most highly utilized in the program. And some of that is driven by the enrollment priority groups um, and the fact that uh, one of those priorities is that people say they have a goal to maintain, to get or keep uh, competitive integrated employment. So we know a lot of people coming in the program who've stated that as part of their enrollment process. So obviously then it makes sense that we would be looking at uh, employment services in their plan. Um, so I just, this is a slide we, I shared on a prior um, call that we did, but I just wanted to go back to it and just, um, just let you know how we're prioritizing walking through the services with you. We're, we're looking at, um, uh, the next slide, where most of the enrollment slots are. Um, so they're, they're, tenant, they're reserved for uh, most of them for group three, which is adults living with family or other natural supports. Um, and then group two is transition age youth, um, also living with family or other natural supports. And then we have the 1915 I group, which is folks who don't meet the institutional level of care, so can't qualify for the um, 1915C waiver, but we now have a program uh, with a smaller package of services where we can serve those folks and uh, basically prevent them getting to the point where they would need um, in an institutional level of care. So 
that those are the main those are the groups that we have where we have the most slots so if you look at well which services are we offering to those groups to the 1915c group two and three and then the 1915i um, this is the listing of the services um, so we thought we'd focus on you know the ser first services we think will be highly utilized and then second services that are new and different um, to just dig in with you on uh, on those services. So again, starting with employment, um, I want to start with the what the service category called employment supports individuals. So you all are familiar with what's in the waiver applications and what was in the RFP. So we don't, you know, we're not belaboring telling you what you already know, but we want to talk about the implementation of the services um, and how they'll be paid for. Um, so, uh, as you're probably aware, employment supports individuals kind of an umbrella category, and there are um, sub services under that, and it's listed here as a progression of services. Um, ex and I'll walk through each of these exploration, discovery, a job development plan service, job development itself, job coaching, and career advancement. So. Um, it's it's a progression and the, the goal here is to meet people where they're at. We aren't going to force anybody to, you know, go through every service. You have to start at the beginning and work through. We're just going to have a, have a way to meet them wherever they're at and get them the right service to move them forward um, with employment. Um, so just just to, obviously these services can only be provided on a one-to-one -one basis. A DSP can't can't be providing any of these types of services to two, two or more people at the same time. And obviously our goal is just helping people get and keep jobs in the community. Uh, we do expect that and, and know that we need to make sure people are using work incentives um, so that they can maximize their earnings and, and not um, neg negatively affect their benefits. Um, so if you are not a, an approved provider of work incentive benefits counseling, that's one of the service categories we have. Um, you'll want to, if you're providing employment services, you'll want to know who are the providers of, of work incentive benefits counseling in my area. And I imagine you already have some idea of who they are uh, because we'll, we'll want to make sure that uh, people have that information. There's a lot of mythology out there. There's a lot of truth out there, but we wanna make sure people are making choices based on accurate information. Um, and um, DSPs will get some, you know, need to have some basic understanding of work incentives um, because they may be asked by individuals or their families about, oh, isn't this a bad thing? I'm gonna lose, you know, I'm gonna lose access to services or lose my benefits. Um, you fortunately as providers do not have to deal with the determining if the service is otherwise available through ADRS. That is a support coordinator's role. I know we have uh, some region two support coordination agencies, so this would apply to you. Uh, so, but if you're a provider of employment support, you it's not your job to figure out whether the service is otherwise available from ADRS. That's the job of support coordinators. So it's easy. If you get an authorization to provide the service, you, you can go ahead and do that because um, the support coordinator would have uh, confirmed it's not otherwise available through ADRS. Um, so uh, it, generally uh, federal requirements are there limits on how you can use this funding so i just put this slide in you can't use it for incentive payments that are made to an employer to encourage them to hire somebody through support employment um, we're going to talk about co-worker supports a little later that's another uh, service that's not considered an incentive payment um, you can't use this funding to pass through to users of support employment. So you can't use this funding to pay their wages or give them some kind of um, bonus for, for showing up at work. Uh, that's not permitted under Medicaid. Um, and you can't use it for training that's not directly related to supported employment. So those are just standard requirements. Every state has to have that language. 
Um, you can, um, if I don't know if any of you are ticket to work employment networks, there is a process you go through with the Social Security Administration to become a, an employment network or an EN. Um, if you do uh, have that, um, you can receive those milestone payments for an individual you serve, even if you're re also receiving Medicaid funding through Employment Supports Individual. Um, so the process obviously is that uh, if you're familiar with Ticket to Work, every person with a disability gets who has Social Security benefits gets this ticket. It's actually paper, um, but they can assign that to a provider um, who is an EN, and then uh, as they meet milestones in their employment, you can um, receive those payments from Social Security. So the good news is, if you if you do that, you can all, you can be paid by Medicaid and also get those payments. So I'm going to start at the beginning, and I apologize for how much text is in this PowerPoint, but it's meant to be a resource for you going forward. Um, I'm going to start with the first service exploration and how how that's going to be implemented. Um, this is a service that's basically there for people who aren't sure whether they want to work or not um, to go through a, a short process to be able to make an informed choice. Um, so this is uh, different from just having a person-centered planning meeting and raising the option of work. And in the context of that meeting, somebody says yes or no. This is actually, let's, let's expose you to what this is and then um, ask you if you'd like to work. Um, so it's limited. We try to get this service done in a reasonable period of time. It's 30 calendar days um, that you have to uh, complete the service with somebody. It, anybody who say who said coming into the program that they have a goal to work, um, this would not be an appropriate service for them because they've already said they have a goal to work. But there will be people enrolling in the program who maybe didn't say they had that and said, you know, they have a goal to sustain their current living arrangement. So in that case, if uh, we want to make sure they um, can explore the option for employment, this would be a service that allows you to do that, allows you to spend time with people exploring it. So it, uh, I'll walk you through what this is and the tools we have that we will also distribute with this PowerPoint to help with this service. Um, so you um, identify the, the person delivering this service, identifies the person's interest areas, experiences, skills they might have that are relevant to employment um, at a very at a introductory level. Um, look for opportunities in the community, uh, a few like three different options to go see uh, businesses and jobs that relate to what you learned about the person. Um, some basic education about the fact that work incentives exist and what work incentive benefits counseling is. Um, we don't expect this service to provide that counseling, but they need to expose people to the idea it exists. Um, and then how support employment works. So if I go this direction, what happens in supported employment? Um, how does it, how does ADRS figure into it, making sure people have a good understanding. Um, and then generally we're trying to identify what are people's concerns, their hesitations, their objections, um, including family or guardians who are involved. And we're trying to figure out how we make sure we would address them uh, with giving them good information, and explaining how things work. So 30, as I said, 30 calendar days to complete the service. Then after that, you have 15 days to submit a report that shows that you completed the service. Um, it, we have a required template for that report, uh, which is good because it uh, allows the person working, delivering this service to make sure they uh, cover everything that needs to be covered and they have an easy way to document it. Uh, we don't just say write up a narrative. Um, it just takes you through all of the different components um, of the report. And so I'll, I'm going to stop sharing this, attempt my technology skills, and show you just a quick glimpse at what that report looks like. Um, 
I've got a whole lot of windows open here, so. I've got a lot of reports to show you. Here we go. So if you can see that now, um, this is the report. So it, it gets you uh, who are the key people that were engaged during the exploration service, collecting the information on the person, what they currently do with their time, prior work experience, volunteer history, chores they consistently do, strong interests, skills, talents, hobbies, benefits they currently receive. So you go through this. In these reports that we're going to be providing to you, we always have this log so that you, the person delivering the service can just track how many uh, how many days did I actually meet with the person in, uh, to deliver this service? What was I doing? Um, how much time did I spend, including travel time? And how many miles did I drive? It's in there so that we can make sure we verify that the payments for these services are accurate in relation to how much time is being spent. That's why we're asking for that information. It helps us verify the payment over time. Uh, but anyway, you see that you, um, we look at who was engaged, who did you talk with, what were their positive thoughts about integrated employment, and then uh, when you began, and then wh where were they at when you ended the service to try to see um, if the provision of the service, uh, the experiences, the information made a difference to people's uh, level of interest and level of excitement about um, obtaining employment. Um, it also um, looks at other people in the person's life um, and where they may have had concerns, needs for uh, additional information when you started the service and then what you did to address that during the service. Um, then we want to know what firsthand experiences did they go see the three options, a uh, minimum of three options to explore employment in the community, and um, how did the person react, and then there's a summary where there's a set of questions that they, that you answer, the staff answer about the service being delivered. So, uh, and then the final part is what were the outcomes? Did the person decide they want, are open to pursuing employment? If they have a guardian, what's their position? And uh, what is the position of other critical natural supports in their life? And what are next steps? So again, it helps, it helps frame what we want to get out of the service and it helps uh, staff have a, a template to save them kind of being expected to write some long report. Um, so that these are uh, these are going to be, uh, I'll put the PowerPoint back up now. Uh, these are gonna be uh, available to you and expected that, that when the service is ended, these reports will come to support coordinators and, and that will then uh, justify the billing for the service. Um, so it's not an hourly service. This is an outcome-based service. You're paid for the completion of the service and the and, and the submission of that report. Um, so uh, we built this based on like other states that have this service. I've helped a, a two or three different states now add this to their waivers. Um, so the outcome payment assumes an average of 25 hours to complete the service and write the report. So it's all hours, not just face-to-face -face time. It's all the hours that uh, a person puts in to go through this process with people. And what we have as well, which I will send, uh, Harrison will send out with the report template, is a guide to the recommended steps. And I'm just going to quick show you that because it's really important. We developed this in other states because we had staff who kind of didn't know where, how to manage the time that they had. And so they were um, they were spending way more time than the ser than the service you know was paying for. Um, and we said, well, we really need something that's going to help them understand. Uh, how much time we anticipate they would spend on each of these um, 
each of these steps. So, and of course, I have so many files, I'm having trouble finding it. Um, I wanted to show you what it looks like. Um, all right, I, I don't see that, I'm sorry. Uh, it will come out to you. And again, this is where we're saying, uh, if you have questions, um, then follow up. If you've got employment staff who aren't on the call today, they can listen to this recording. Um, and then they can also come and um, talk with talk with me further if they want to, you know, talk about what what is required. Lisa, so, uh, Lisa, there's a ahead. question in the chat for you. Yep. Okay. I think Deanna asked, uh, "Are service documents electronic, online, or paper?" Uh, our goal is for them to be electronic. So um, fillable forms is what we would uh, be providing. Um, it's possible for a staff, you know, a person might want to print this out, might want to print it out and have it with them. Um, so that would certainly be possible. Uh, we want to make it, you know, as easy to use as, as we can. Um, so anyway, if I had the steps and time frames, it lays out, here's the steps in completing an exploration service, and here's about how much time you should spend for each step, and it shows how it adds up to about 25 hours. So again, the log in the report helps us verify that, that those assumptions are correct, um, and it's uh, an outcome payment of $900 which is 25 hours at $36 an hour, our um, hourly rate for a job coach. So this would be done by a job coach who's obviously trained on this, how to provide this service. Um, the, and the steps, they have that steps and time frame document and they, they have the report template and they've been trained on how to complete the report. So that's the plan for this service. Are there other questions in the chat box, Harrison? I'm probably no, that's it. I've been answered. Okay. I'm going to go on to discovery. It's structured much the same way. So, so that's, um, you know, we have one consistent way of approaching services. Discovery is for a person who says, yes, I, I would like to work in the community, but I, I really don't know what kind of job, you know, I might want, what kind of job I might be successful at, you know, what kind of employer would work for me. And they need to get that figured out before they jump into job development. So discovery is that service that would be in between uh, for people uh, who know they would like a job but aren't sure what. Um, this is an evidence-based practice nationally, and you may all, your staff may already have training or experience with doing discovery. Uh, so basically it looks for three things, strong interests towards some aspect of the labor market with the assumption, I have to like my job, not just be good at it in order for me to stay. Um, then skills, strengths, and contributions. What do people have that to offer employers? And that is, um, you know, sometimes that's translating skills they have that they show us at home or they show us in the community and other things they're doing and translating how that could be valuable to an employer. Um, and the last thing is conditions that, that is necessary for success. We all have conditions um, that are important for us in terms of our work. So how close it is to my home or um, what the co-workers, you know, whether I have nearby co-workers or accessibility, those are all things that would be conditions that would be important to identify before you do job development. Uh, so we have a template for a discovery profile uh, similar to the exploration template that walks through all the elements of, of the discovery process that we want, that we expect uh, information we expect we would get from delivering the service. Um, so that will be, again, this is an outcome-based service. So you're paid for the discovery profile uh, when it is submitted to the support coordinator. 
Um, that is then can be used obviously to help the person access ADRS. If they're coming with a discovery profile, it's really wonderful information that helps guide what ADRS does to them. Discovery is a little more intense process. So we allowed up to 60 days um, to complete the service. Uh, so this is a, additional information on um, the service itself, um, and it, as I said, we have a pro discovery profile template. Um, what we are advising that if people, if you get an authorization for discovery, um, people should be assisted to apply to ADRS at the point you start discovery because it takes 60 days. Well, we know ADRS takes some time too to process an applicant to get them de deemed eligible. Um, 60 days is not unreasonable to expect that to happen. So if we help them apply to ADRS when they start discovery, by the time they get a counselor and they're ready to write a plan, we will have completed discovery. So that's, that's the reasoning behind that timing. Um, and then of course, we're gonna share the profile, uh, send it along with the person to ADRS. So again, no more than 60 calendar days to complete it. Um, then you have 15 days after that to actually submit the profile um, to the support coordinator. So a total of 75 days. Um, uh, we will require a certain discovery template uh, similar to the exploration one, and we'll send that out with this PowerPoint. Um, or if you have been trained on discovery already and um, through ADRS, uh, we, we will accept the ADRS profile. The traditional, it's the Mark Golden Associates uh, discovery profile document. So we don't want to uh, pull people away from that if they've been trained on that. So either the required template or one of those uh, ADRS discovery profiles. So again, you're paid on, on receipt of the acceptable profile, and we assume the outcome payment for this assumes 34 hours uh, to complete the service uh, by a, a qualified job developer. And that's all hours, not just face-to-face -face time. So the outcome payment for discovery for the profile is $1,360. So 34 hours times $40 an hour for a qualified job developer. Similar to exploration, we have this discovery recommended steps and timeframes, which says- Here it is. Gives a Come guide. sit on the porch with me. Come sit on the porch with me, okay. We got somebody with their mic. If you're not muted, would you mute please? Just so we don't get background, thanks. Um, so uh, we have a recommended steps and timeframes guide for discovery so that any uh, job developer doing this service has a sense of how do I get everything done in the 34 hours? And that'll go out with the template to you uh, from Harrison. So again, it's job developer trained on the service um, and a, understands how to do discovery. Job development plan, this is sometimes skipped over and it's not a payable. Uh, we made this a payable for uh, the community waiver program. This is an opportunity uh, for a job developer to, to, to meet with the person and their allies, review the results of discovery and make a clear plan uh, for getting a job. So this, if this is authorized, it would be 30 days because it's not it's not a huge amount of work. Um, it includes a planning meeting. So calling together the person, other key people who contributed to discovery and maybe the person went through exploration too. Um, going, reviewing all the results of, of discovery and exploration and developing the plan that will guide the job development effort. Um, so this is uh, a smaller service, but it's really critical in my opinion to actually achieving that job, finding that job and making sure it fits who the person is. 
so uh, we will have a uh, there is a job development plan template. We'll send it out to you. Um, it's it's due 30 days from the date you get the authorization from the service for the service guide for what that job developer will do in writing a plan using our template. It's $240 done by a job developer and it assumes six hours of time to complete the service and write the plan. Again, not just face-to-face -face time. Um, so if this is authorized, you we would then end up with a, a written plan that's going to be followed for job development. Um, then we get to job development. Now, in most cases, these things will be covered by ADRS. They will be eligible and um, they will give services to them. If they don't, for whatever reason, and we know um, ADRS isn't available to somebody, we've the support coordinator has verified that. Then the community waiver program, so again, it's using the plan and under competitive integrated employment, um, using all the information that we might have on the person from other services. And it's, this is also paid on an outcome basis uh, once the person has successfully completed 50 hours on the job. So um, that, that, that is a point at which we would say, um, it's, it's looking like this person wants this job and the employer is, you know, happy with them up to that point. So we want to make sure you, job developers get paid, but we also want to make sure there's a tie to some likelihood of the person sustaining their job. I will just want to clarify, coaching for the person is a separate service. It does not, this payment structure does not mean the job developer has to coach the person for the first 50 hours. Um, that is not, that will be separate, separately authorized. Um, so the, the team, the support coordinator, the person and their team would just determine that the job is a good match for the individual's goals and their preferences and skills, um, conditions for success. So um, that would be in the referral for job development or in the job development plan. So the job has to be acceptable to the person and be a good match. Um, obviously, we, you know, we don't want somebody who wants to Lisa, you're, you're on mute. Sorry, Sorry. I, I went out and back. I've got some kids who are doing online school, which probably won't surprise anybody here. Um, let me try to share my screen again. Can't let them not get their schooling in. All right. Uh, okay, so we expect um, that... Uh, we're going to use obviously best practices, but anybody who's trained to be a job developer in the in this community waiver program would have that training on what the best practices are. The outcome payment for this is sixteen hundred dollars. So once a person gets a job and has put it in the first fifty hours, then you would get the payment for $1,600 uh, to complete the service. I am gonna turn off my camera because I am concerned that I'm, I don't have a good enough connection here. Um, job coaching, as I said, separately authorized for the person when they start their job. Um, and obviously job development, you gotta have a staff member who's qualified as a job developer. Uh, job coaching. So mostly what we expect the community waiver program will do is sustain people in their employment. Um, this is the service that may uh, go on for a period of time. Um, and, and I am not a fan of uh, forcing the zeroing out of job coaching. I believe that maintaining 
coach involvement at a really low level, if that's all people need, is really important for long-term um, career advancement and preventing job loss. So our structure for paying for job coaching is not to cut it off at some point, and it's very individualized based on people's needs. Uh, but we do want to encourage fading. So uh, coaching will have a fading plan attached to it. It's, it's a, it's a, again, it's a template, but an authorization for coaching, you'll, you'll submit a fading plan. What are we going to do to try to help the person be, be more independent on the job um, in the next period of time we have the service authorized? There's lots of ways for people to become independent. I know um, a lot of people just say natural supports, natural supports, natural supports. That's not the only strategy. Um, you probably realize there's good teaching and training, systematic instruction. There's technology that we can use that's very helpful. Um, and there's uh, adaptive equipment, other things that can be done. Uh, so we'll want to use all the best practice strategies um to try to make sure people can be as independent as possible um <laughs> we can't pay for things that would be normally available to an employee without a disability so the the normal training supervision co-worker supports equipment things like that that are otherwise available to any employee doing the job um, would not be included this is uh, above and beyond that um, the amount of time we authorize for coaching, it will be a percentage of the person's hours worked. Um, so we, you know, we, we adjust the amount of coaching they get to based on their needs. Um, we did uh, tier the payments here based on the person's level of disability and the length of time a person has been employed. Those are the two key factors that seem to predict um, how much um, coaching people need. So uh, it's pretty obvious if somebody has a higher level of disability, um, they will probably need more coaching than someone with a lower level. And if somebody's just started their job, it's more like it's very likely they will need more support than somebody who's had their job for five years. So those principles are kind of woven into the payment structure. So this is a qualified job coach. Um, it's a 15 minute unit payment for job coaching. And there's basically three levels of disability that um, based on people's ICAP score at the time of the authorization. Um, then the unit payment changes based on the length of time the person has held the job. So the support coordinator will be keeping track um, and we're gonna look at how much fading has been accomplished. So there's a there's an incentive built into the payment structure for you to fade. Um, if you fade, we're not going to just take the money away. That doesn't make any sense to pay to pay you to fade. You do the good fading and then we just cut your funding. Um, so their payment in this model is higher per hour per hour if you if you achieve a greater level of fading. So let me show you what it looks like. Um, Basically, we have that $36 an hour going rate for job coaching, um, and, and that's based on a cost model we did, um, and I, I think, I'm pretty sure um, it's close to the IDLAH waivers, but I think it might be a slightly higher. Um, so we look at, how, on the left side, how long people have been in their job, and across the top, what's their ICAP score? Um, and that, then, then you get to what the rates are for, for job coaching for a 15 minute unit. And so um, the more you fade, the higher the 15 minute unit rate. It's a slight adjustment. It's, um, it's designed to be an incentive, but not then prohibit people who need more support from actually getting it. So uh, we would just look at that and there, there will be billing codes attached to each of these um, that the support coordinator will use. So again, the more you can fade, um, the higher the 15 minute unit rate for the person. At the bottom, I wanna point out the stabilization and monitoring. So anybody who gets to the point where they're, they're as independent, they need you know about, about one hour a week of support or less, 
um, you, you will continue to get a payment. It's a flat payment of $156 a month to cover you staying connected to that person and to that employer and making sure that um, career advancement needs are met and issues that pop up that might cause job loss are identified and addressed quickly. Um, and so that, that payment will stay there as long as you are, um, the person is working uh, and you are the coaching agency. Any questions on that? I know it looks a little complex. It's not really when we get right down to it. So we'll just say, how long has the person been in the job? What's their ICAP score? How much coaching do they need? And that's how you arrive at the 15 minute unit payment. Lisa, uh, this is Susan. I have a question. In uh, the Milestones program, people that are in long-term supports, which would be similar to the stabilization and monitoring, uh, sometimes there's, you know, a need for more intense supports again. What, is there a way to go back after, you know, like two years or something like that, that a situation? Yeah. Uh-huh. Go yeah. ahead. If, so if, if it comes time to reauthorize or the provider feels they need an adjustment, they would go back to the support coordinator. And if, it, if people uh, all of a sudden for a temporary period of time need 65% coaching in this example down in the bottom left, um, you know, because something happened, something came up, there's an issue, you caught it, but you need to get in and do more intense coaching then that, you would go back to um, the rate that um, is, shows a higher percentage of coaching going on. So it's designed to, to allow that. Um, if, if a person's been in the job for 25 plus months and they're in the stabilization, they don't need more than one hour a week. Um, and then all of a sudden there's an issue, um, you can go back to um, whatever, level of coaching they need for that period of time. And then when that everything's stable, we go back to the stabilization and monitoring rate. Okay. Does that make, make sense? Sure. Okay. So we'll be training support coordinators. The support coordinators obviously are gonna have uh, pretty intense training. They're gonna understand and have um, tools and guides that help them um, understand with all of these services and how they would be authorized. Uh, career advancement is a service as well. So we don't want people stuck um, and when they actually want either more hours or a second job. Um, that if they're underemployed, we want to address that with people. Um, they, may, they may want more hours or a promotion or um, the, some people where there's no opportunity within their current employer, they, they want to go get a second job so they can work more hours. So um, this just has two components to it. Um, the one um, would be the plan, and then the second would be actually achieving the outcome. Um, people um, can get this service if they have a supported employment uh, individual. Um, so we would look at what, what does the person want, two outcomes, um, what, is their, what is their goal for career advancement? What, what are they trying to achieve? Um, and then uh, actually implementing that plan, achieving that goal is the second payment. Um, this can't be included on a PCP for somebody if they have another service to obtain employment. So they, you know, if they don't, that would indicate they don't yet have employment. So we wouldn't uh, authorize this. Um, and this can't be authorized retroactively. So if somebody gets a promotion and, and it's all done, you can't, um, you know, you can't come back and authorize this service after the fact. So there's two payments here. The first one is similar to um, jo uh, the job development plan. This is a career advancement plan. So when you uh, create the plan with somebody uh, that defines their goal and how they're going to get there, um, and you submit the plan, you get the payment for that. The second payment, 750 is um, paid when the person actually achieves that goal. Um, and it's less than job development because people are already employed 
Um, it's assumed that they're doing well at their current job and this is why they want a second job or, um, or more or a promotion. So um, it's, this is a payment for you negotiating um, that job. And once people have um, completed the first 50 hours in that promoted position or that second job, you get that payment. So the outcome, the total of those outcome payments, if you do the plan and get the outcome is $990. And that's uh, based on the assumption it's going to take just under 25 hours for a job developer to do the plan and negotiate the promotion or the second job. Um, so again, this is a job developer. Uh, I've seen this used in other states with people who were in their jobs for years and years. And then somebody asked them about more hours, a second job, promotion. Um, and it's been exciting to see what's possible for people who are doing really well already in employment. Questions on that? Okay. Um, individual services that are under employment. Uh, it all, the definitions are also state if people have any personal assistance while you're delivering the service that um, that would be addressed by the people providing the service. Um, Working and the only thing they don't need for personal care needs or other types of personal assistance needs. The authorization could switch then to personal assistance community uh, because we, uh, CMS has a rule that job coaching can't um, only be personal assistance. So it can include it if it's needed, but if it becomes a situation where that's all you're doing, uh, we'd switch it over to personal assistance community. Transportation for this is not included in the rates that are paid for the service. Transportation to and from um, these services would be separately handled under community transportation, um, but transportation during the service is included. So if I'm doing discovery with somebody um, and I meet them, I meet them at uh, the library, um, the transportation of the person to and from the library is not included in these rates, but if I then, if we then go to a business to do a tour, um, obviously that is included in the rate. Uh, I want to say something about face-to-face -face versus non-face-to-face -face, because this comes up. You know the rule is two face-to-face -face services can't be billed during the same period of time. But if you were doing a, a, a one of these services that's paid on an outcome basis and you are putting in time for that service while a person is over here receiving uh, maybe personal assistance home or personal assistance community, that is not an issue. So if I'm writing up the exploration report um, and the person is um, getting personal assistance home at the same time, um, that's not a problem because these are outcome-based services. Um, so you might be doing job development on behalf of somebody at a point where they're receiving another face-to-face -face service. And the way that, because this, these are outcome-based services, we're not gonna run into that problem where you build two 15-minute units at the same time. Okay, um, all of these services I just covered, you can't do with, uh, groups. So even two people, it's all one-to-one -one, um, individualized. Um, job coaching does not include supports for volunteering or anything that's unpaid, like an unpaid internship. It's got to be a paid job, a competitive wage. Um, it doesn't support training in a in a shelter workshop or any kind of facility-based provider setting, use this service in a business that might come. Um, and I mentioned before, you can't pay for supervision and other activities that would 
that would be normally available to another employee who doesn't have a disability. Okay, uh, I'm gonna go on to coworker supports, which we have as a separate service definition. Um, but I just wanna stop there. Does anybody have any questions on this employment supports individual? And it's perfectly fine if you have questions at some future point, just get in touch and, and let us, you know, get those on the Q&A. Harrison's been great in um, assembling Q&A. Um, so you submit a question and then we answer it for everybody. I'm gonna go on to the service called coworker supports. Um, and this is a, a great option for certain employment situations uh, where it allows um, uh, payment to go directly to the employer. It's not an incentive to hire. It's a payment for coworkers or supervisors to be providing the extra support that people might need um, on the job so that you don't have to put a job coach in there. And um, so this can work in, certain, in, in a lot of situations where we find it hard to find a job coach um, uh, I know there were certain, I remember a scenario where a guy was working at a horse farm, uh, mucking out stalls and it was pretty far out and they, the agency couldn't, couldn't find a job coach to do that. And it wasn't cost effective to have them drive all the way out there. So they used coworker supports to get him the extra support he needed, um, to do the job that was above and beyond the normal supports a employer would provide. So we do this through an agency like yours, a provider. So you've, if you've said we, we will do coworker supports, this is how it works. Um, you enter into an agreement with the employer to reimburse them for the cost of that coworker's time. Um, and it's extremely cost effective. If I have to send a job coach to a site to do half an hour of support, I, I have to pay that job coach's time and travel to get there, do the half an hour and leave and pay them to drive wherever they're going next. Um, with coworker supports, you're only paying for the half an hour that the, co that the coworker provided the extra support. So it can be really cost effective um, for a lot of scenarios that we have out there with supported employment. Um, some, some employers do not want an external job coach in their uh, organization. They just don't want anybody there who isn't their employee. And this, ordinarily, we'd have to say that's, we can't do supported employment there. Now we can, because if the employer is open to coworker supports, then you can get the person hired um, and the supports they need would come through the employees of the business. Um, the, we, we're going to do this carefully. We want to make sure that the examples that we use in the beginning are really good and work well so that we can um, develop more of them. Um, so it's going to be authorized on no, no more than 180 days at a time and then reviewed. Uh, again, we will get involved with you to help with these situations when they're set up so that we all learn together. Um, the actual amount of coworker supports is based on the person's individual need, and we do an assessment. The assessment basically says, um, for what reasons would we we put a paid job coach in here? What what is that need? And if the coworkers uh, will meet that need, we pay the employer for that. Um, so again, it's got to be above and beyond the natural supports. It's got to be uh, supports that you'd say we'd otherwise have to have a job coach here. Um, uh, and then we want to make sure if there already are natural supports above and beyond what's typical that a employer has committed to doing, that we don't um, supplant that and start paying for it. So there are employers. The neat thing about this, and we do a lot of this where I'm from, um, is that when you engage employers about potentially being able to pay them for the extra supports, sometimes they just say, that's okay, we'll do it. We, you know, we understand these are the supports the coach is providing. We're, we're good with doing it. You don't need to pay us. And that's a fabulous outcome because it allows us to leverage more natural supports 
but we have a conversation where we are willing to pay if necessary. So um, it creates a really good way to engage the employer. Um, you can use coworker supports from the start of somebody's employment. You don't have to put a job coach in. And again, if an employer doesn't want a job coach, this is a perfect solution. Um, or if it just seems like this is the best way to get the person the support, let's engage the employer and see if they're willing. So you can do it from day one. Um, you can also do it when you when the coaching costs are pretty high. That that's where I would always look at this. So if you got somebody who's driving an hour to coach somebody an hour, um, think about coworker supports and it being much more cost effective and allowing you to stretch your coaches further. You don't need so many coaches and they're hard, sometimes they're hard to find and keep. Person has to agree to the model and of course, so does the employer. <laughs> and sometimes we use this when we think the person will be able to work without, with nothing but natural supports. If that person says, I don't want coaching, I wanna just be independent. We can use this as a temporary bridge um, so we don't, we, from day one, we're engaging coworkers and supervisors because we expect the person will be able to work without supports. Um, frankly, I've seen this in employers. Employers will, will give it up. They won't, they won't want to keep getting paid um, once they see the person is able to do this, able to work with just the natural supports. So we still want to focus on fading. We don't want the coworkers of the business thinking that, oh, we need to, you know, hand over hand do things. They need, they still need to understand that when they're giving supports, they're trying to help the person be independent, that that's the goal. Um, so the other um, thing when I look at this is when fading of regular job coaching has stopped. So we have faded maybe down to whatever, 50% of the time, and then we can't seem to get any more fading. That's when, you know, you look at would coworker supports be more cost effective? Lisa, I'm speaking uh, from experience. Yes, go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say uh, for people who are on SSI as well, this can be an impairment related work expense too. I don't know if you've got experience with that, but we've used it before. Yes, er, yes, er we for short. Yes, the job coaching costs can be done that. That's, that's why we really have the work incentive benefits counselors and that service in this, in this waiver because that's really, really important. Um, so I was saying I'm speaking from experience and that's because I have a 16 year old son who has an intellectual disability and who is with VR, uh, our state VR agency for support and employment, just started a job um, 20, about 20 hours a week and we are using coworker supports. So DV, our VR agency is paying the business um, and he has a supported employment agency that has a drop-in job coach that just makes sure everything's working. And I can't tell you how valuable this is because it's natural. There's no external coach standing with him that, that stigmatizes him or makes him stand out as somehow different. Um, and the coworkers are stepping up um, to provide him the extra supports he needs. So I'm speaking as a mom um, and telling you this does work and it can be a really good outcome so we want to help you implement this um, to, to demonstrate what can be possible when you see a situation where, hey, this looks like coworker supports would work. So we have uh, a whole, go ahead, sorry. Hey, this is Anthony of Volunteers of America Support and Employment. With the, what is the turnaround? Well, I'll, I know all this is probably new with the coworker support. Um, and the payment will go through the agency and then it trickle to the, the employers. Uh, again, I, I'm, I'm trying to get a clear picture on how do the employers, when you're making a pitch to the employer about uh, coworker support, how are those payments received for yeah. um, through the waiver? Great question. That's what I was getting. I'm getting to the actual logistics of doing this. So, 
Um, yes, you're, you are correct. The payment flows through the provider agency because you, um, and then you get a payment for beat monitoring and being available to support it. Um, so you would arrange the um, coworker supports um, you, there's a checklist and the nice thing is this being done elsewhere so we can use all those tools that already exist. A checklist of, I have of when co co-worker supports might be a good option. So I, that we will send that out. We have a tool that you use to assess what exactly is the coach doing or would a paid coach be doing in this situation that we would say we need the employer to do. Uh, to commit to. So you have a tool that figures out exactly what kind of supports and when the person needs them to calculate what's a fair payment to the employer. How much time are coworkers going to be doing um, extra supports for people? Um, you then look at what does that employee cost that employer? So what is their hourly cost to employ them? And that's basically how you work out um, how much they would be paid. So there's a coworker supports agreement that um, outlines what they'll be doing, how much, and how much they'll be paid. And we have it. We have an agreement, you know, that we can use as an example. So Harrison's going to make sure you get all these pieces along with this PowerPoint. And as I said, please come back to me with questions if you still have questions. We want to be very supportive as you try to put this in place. Um, so that we do this, uh, do this right. Once you do it once or twice, you get the get the hang of the process. Um, so they would be off. You would be paying the employer based on 15 minute units of service, um, and then you would get a monthly unit authorization for the oversight and the facilitation of the arrangement. So um, if you agree that, um, I think. I think my son has like four hours a week uh, of he's going to work 20 hours. He's got they figured out he needs over that 20 hours, about four hours of extra time and support. So instead of sending in a job coach, they're paying the uh, employer for four hours of the co-workers time. And that employer said, here's what it costs me for 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 the typical co-worker that would be supporting my son. Um, so that is the that is how you figure it out. How many 15 minute units and what does it cost for that co -work? What does it cost the employer to have that coworker? And then there's a flat $100 a month uh, fee that's paid to you as the provider agency for just doing the arrangement, you know, paying the employer and checking in and making sure everything's going well. Um, and obviously that helps you being able to collect that also helps with the costs that uh, you incur for setting up the arrangement. Um, so if we have any situation where we end up paying more than what a job coach costs, um, we're going to have to approve that uh, through the central office, DDD central office, because it's supposed to be a cost effective alternative. But there may be situations where it does cost a bit more, but the value for the person um, is, so, is so good that um, it would be approved. Normally, though, I'll tell you, it's not going to, it usually costs less. Hey, one, one more question with the co-worker support. Um, yep. Once, when, when can you start using the co-worker support? Uh, just say, for example, you, you know, the agency provide job coaching and, um, and then, you know, normally the agency with the milestone is 14 days of job coaching. Okay, say if that individual need more than 14 hours of job coaching, you see right now this individual probably need that uh, co-worker support before the case is closed with ADRS. Is there a possibility that the co-worker support can go ahead in before then or you have to wait till the case is closed with BR? Yeah, you have, at this point you have to wait till the case is closed because only because ADRS is not yet and, and uh, Byron may be on here, but I, I don't believe ADRS is currently allowing this arrangement. Um, they can, because that's what's happening with my son here. It's it's the ADRS from our state who is able to pay for this. So it could start earlier if we can work with ADRS around allowing this, but uh, otherwise at the moment, 
uh, it would have to be after the case is closed. Which they stated like three years ago that they, they weren't closing cases anymore. They're just keeping the files. What do you mean? Uh, well, I mean that they, that they they stopped closing cases. Um, uh, it, it's a longer discussion. So Unsuccessfully, but, you mean? Yeah, closing people without jobs. Yeah, just leave. They, they said the liability was too great. Yeah, Close. yeah. Well, this is a scenario where people have a job, they've gotten a job, they're stable, they're successful. And I think Anthony was asking, can we- No, I can understand we that. I was just- Yeah. Uh, yeah. I got that. Just Okay. That. Yeah. So for now, I don't think we can combine it with VR, uh, ADRS, unless um, they would adopt the model. But And I'm not saying that's out of the question because other state VR agencies have adopted it. Lisa, there's a question in the chat. Um, the question is, um, I just read the whole thing. I may have missed this, but when are these services used instead of milestones? Is it just that the person chooses waiver services and not milestones through VR? So this would, the Medicaid rules require that we use VR first if it's available to the person. So the support coordinator would always be looking at um, trying to help the person access ADRS first. When ADRS closes the case or is not providing the service that the person needs, um, that's when the waiver can then pay. So um, if somebody's going through the ADRS process, this would pick up afterwards um, and uh, would be their long-term support. Could and be. And all you have to do is get vocational rehabilitation to agree that they do not have any services appropriate for this situation for your person. Doesn't have to close the case. They just have to admit they don't have any services that are appropriate to fix that problem. That's correct. And they now under the new federal law that, that passed for their system, they have to keep the case open 90 days after they stop providing service. So clearly, they're, they're, you're going to have a period of time where they no longer are providing the coaching. It's now funded through the waiver. Um, they still have the case open because they have to confirm that 90 days after they stop providing service, the person is still working. So it's it, the old language that we don't waiver doesn't pay until the case is closed is no longer applicable because of the changes in WIOA, the federal law for them. So all of this, you know, we're gonna, um, this is things that support coordinators are gonna be taught. So they understand that they can authorize long-term supports once VR stops providing them, even if the case is still open. And the job coaches and providers need to understand it too, so they can advocate it even when support coordinators may not be certain about it. Yeah, this is the kind of approach to dual training. We're training you as the providers, we're training support coordinators on the same content. Frankly, if ADRS wants training on it, we'll give it to them too. So everybody's getting the same information about how to implement. Let, let me, and, and maybe I misunderstood. I, I just want to get a clear picture on the 90 days when you, when, when they can start receiving those waiver services after VR is closed. After 90 days, the VR, of course, closed. Then we saying we got another 90 days? No, no. Oh, okay. I just want to make sure I didn't hear that. Right. Yeah, okay. yeah, no. So, okay, here's the scenario. The person gets a job, they start working. VR is giving them supports to keep the job. They're paying a provider to do the coaching. Um, at the point they say, this person is stable on the job, we are done. They would have, in the past, they would have closed the case right then and there. Now they, what they're going to do is say they're stable. We're stopping funding coaching. They're not going to close the case. So they're going to hold the case open for 90 days after they stop providing the coaching. Um, and then they would close the case. But waiver can kick in as soon as they stop providing the coaching. 
Hey, this is Byron. I think we're confusing. I'm, I'm confused a little bit, and I think maybe the conversation get confusing. I'm under the impression now that ADRS's milestone three was the job coaching, and once that coaching ended, the person was considered stable on the job. That fourth milestone is that 90-day period of follow-up, and then that's when VR closes the case. So that's the yeah. way I think the milestones work. Right. So – that's great point, Byron. The fourth, when the fourth milestone is in place with VR, which is just 90 days but no service, the waiver can um, provide the service because you're not duplicating. Yes, I'm, that's it. Yep. yep. So we can put, I mean, I'm willing to create any kind of framework that helps people understand. We can create a flow chart if you want that shows that process. But I, but that, I just wanted to stress that, and Byron made the point that they do keep the case open 90 days after they provide, they stop providing coaching. And if a person needs coaching, then you can't have a 90-day gap. So that's when the waiver can pick up. Okay, I'm going to move along. Thank you. Um, uh, coworker supports. Um, uh, part of implementing this is providing, um, uh, they have the, whoever's being providing the support has to pass a background check. Um, the other, the type of background check you would do for a DSP job coach. Um, not everybody in the business. I uh, just want to be clear. It's, it's the coworkers that will be providing the support. N sometimes they will have a background check already on file because the employer does it. Other times they may not. Um, so you, that's part of your role is ensuring those checks are done um, and also that the initial training of those, we want to give those coworkers a little bit of training, not treat them like a job coach or a Medicaid provider, but give them a little bit of training, just an overview of how this is supposed to work and what your role is as a support employment provider that's providing oversight. Good thing is I have a slide deck that's already being used in other states that is just a sit down with the coworker and go through the slide deck. It's not big and intensive, but it covers all the major points. And you just do that once. You do that when you start the arrangement. Um, so this is the content that's in that slide deck. And basically what you, what you can do is brand that slide deck for your agency, adapt it to, for your agency, and you have everything you need to meet the minimum training expectations. They do have to, you know, bill you for the time they spend with the person. So um, helping the employer understand how to do that, um, that's, that's something that's part of the training. Okay, so that's the end of coworker supports. All those tools and things I referenced that help you implement, uh, we will be sending out. Um, and we can also, I think it might be helpful, Harrison, if we worked on just the flow chart for, for the process of setting up coworker supports. So people understand how those tools are used and what order, et cetera. Uh, I'll go into employment support small group. This is also covered in the community waiver program. Um, uh, consistent with what the Fed, CMS has said, we're going to structure this as a service that's designed to help a person um, get to an individual integrated employment job um, or to wrap around that job if it's part time and they want more hours of work and you haven't yet been able to find them more integrated employment. The, so if we focus this service on helping a person get to a regular individual job, we may be doing more than traditional, traditionally is done under this, which is an enclave or a work crew. Um, that, that helps people develop skills and hone their interests and get a reference um, uh, to get an individual job. But there are other things that you can do in this service that would also contribute to moving people towards individual employment. And that is you can facilitate small group career planning and exploration activities under this service. 
small group discovery classes and activities. And I'll show you some resources for that, for these things, um, doing them in, in a small group format. Other educational opportunities that, you know, help people with getting their, a job. So a small group might go to a, a workforce center, a workforce a job center, and use their resources or attend a workshop they have on how to get a job. Um, you could do uh, small group facilitated sessions in a workforce center, a job center. I worked with a group in Tennessee that did that. Um, so they had job center staff actually participating and facilitating. Um, and then, of course, work crews and enclaves are still a part of this, but we want to get the emphasis on this is preparatory for um, getting an individualized integrated job. Um, so maximum size um, for this service in the community waiver program is four. We want people to have adequate support. Um, by, you know, and not have them in groups that are too large. Um, so again, we're focused on their, they're getting knowledge, skills, and experience that will help them um, transition to individual integrated employment. And, and this can always be an addition. I just want to stress that so people don't feel like, well, if I agree to go for a job, then you're going to take this service away. It depends on need. If people want to work more hours and don't have enough hours in their individual job, this still could be used to give them more hours. Um, we have to think about the settings rule, HCBS settings rule. Um, so for small group, uh, we have to make sure that um, that, they, that they're doing this in regular integrated community settings and that they're, the group itself is not causing isolation from other people who don't have disabilities. Obviously, the bigger the group, the more it seems that there isn't uh, a lot of interaction with other people, even if you're in integrated places. So keeping the groups to four, no more than four, should help with that. Um, so places you can do this, as I mentioned, job centers, businesses, uh, post-secondary education campuses, libraries, um, so it has to be an integrated business, industry, or community settings. Um, again, if it's an enclave or work crew, we're looking for do the, the, do the people have routine interactions with other people without disabilities in the setting. Um, it shouldn't feel like they are a little bubble um, and, and they go into a business to do something and um, have no interaction with other people there. So. Obviously, we're trying to facilitate inclusion. Um, and so we're, we're going to be looking at the focus on our, our people uh, being encouraged around exploring their interests, their strengths, their abilities related to individualized employment. Um, so when you give a progress report to the support coordinator on this service, that's going to be really important. So uh, how are you making that happen for the person? Um, and if we have barriers that are in the way of transitioning to integrated employment, um, that we're, we're identifying them and trying to address them. Um, so again, that, that emphasis on this is preparatory for an individual job. Um, that's what the service definition says, and that's what CMS expects. All right, so the payment structure, um, this is an update from last time. We had some questions, concerns from some of the providers about the payment structure we had proposed. Um, so we went back and met with those providers and redid the rate models and uh, agreed to these rates that you see on your screen now, which are higher. Um, so this is the minimum staffing ratio, as I said, is a one to four. Um, it can be a one to two or a one to three, four. And those are the 15 minute unit rates and the hourly rates per person. This is obviously delivered by a qualified job coach. Uh, same prohibitions up that we had for employment individual apply to small group. You can't use the funding from Medicaid from the community waiver program to provide incentive payments to employers to um, have um, 
that employer invite a, a enclave or a work crew into their setting, <coughs> can't use it for payments, pass through to people who are receiving the service. You can't use the Medicaid money to pay them wages or any kind of bonuses. Um, and you can't use it for training that is, isn't directly related to the person's supported employment. Any questions on small group? Okay, we're making it through. Harrison, I'm sorry, I can't seem to see on my screen what time it is. Can you tell me? It's 11.27. 27. Okay. All right. So we're doing okay. I don't want to keep you afternoon. Integrated employment path. This is the last uh, employment service. Um, and this is um, essentially, this is the integrated version of what used to be pre-vocational services. When it used to be the service category that supported people to work in sheltered workshops. Um, this is what states are doing now with that service category to um, get the services into the community, but still not eliminate that service altogether. Um, so it does, it, it, it is meant to help people learn, um, learn and gain skills and experience um, that will generally help them with employability. So we're talking about general skills that would that could assist people with employability across a variety of businesses. Um, you can't use this service to teach people a very specific skill like operating a um, cash register or uh, making a hamburger or um, you know how to how to paint. Um, those are considered really um, job specific and, and in Medicaid world, they say that's the job of ADRS. Um, but if anything that people are doing where they're developing general skills, skills that would soft skills, um, skills that would just help them uh, have, have a job, get a job, keep a job, then we, that's what this can focus on. Uh, so I might be, I might be painting, uh, but I might, maybe be working on how to show up on time, um, how, to, how to follow instructions from my supervisor, how to get along with my coworkers, all of those things, um, uh, what to wear, those, you know, so those are all things, those are those general skills that matter. Um, so this is limited to no more than a year uh, because we don't pe want people to get stuck. Um, this is a years long effort to develop skills can be aligned with the whole process of discovery and job development um, so that when they're ready to look at a job, they've got these, they've been working on the skills that will help them succeed. You can get a one year extension to continue the services for another year if the person's actively pursuing employment. So we don't want anybody to be in this service more than a year without starting that process of looking for a job. But if they've started it and they just haven't found a job, um, we can extend the service for a year. Also, if somebody loses a job and they're out of work and they're trying to find another job, while they're in that process, they could go back to this service for a year. Um, and of course, this is not available if somebody's already receiving job coaching or coworker supports, or they're otherwise working. So if somebody already has integrated employment, they don't need this service. So the kind of general skills that we look for and say, these are the things you're working on, whatever the context, uh, would be the ability to communicate effectively with coworkers, supervisors, and customers. Um, that's key to be successful. Uh, generally accepted work, community workplace conduct and dress, um, ability to follow directions, uh, ability to attend to the tasks you're assigned, uh, problem solving skills at the workplace, um, and workplace safety. And then the last one is mobility training. I need to be able to get to my job. Um, so working on mobility skills are important. So these are the kind of things, they're very, they're general things that would work and help people 
uh, be employable regardless of the type of employment. <laughs> so we, to authorize this service, people do have to have a goal in their person-centered plan that they want to get individual integrated employment. Um, so it'll have, to, and I apologize there, it says ISP, that's who you say P, PCP. Um, so um, if they want to get integrated employment and developing these kinds of skills is important for their success, uh, you would get a referral for these services tied back to their goal to get integrated employment. If people don't have a goal of integrated employment, this is not the appropriate service yet. They need to um, start with exploration to determine if they have, if they want to have employment. Um, when we, um, when people have a goal, you may encounter a referral where they really have no idea of what kind of employment. They would like it, but they have no idea. So you can also use this service to help people figure out what they want. So similar to the small group supported employment, we can use small group facilitated discovery activities or um, uh, completing career planning workbooks that really create a lot of energy and information we need to get people employed. So I pulled these slides from another presentation I did. This, and this will be in, you'll get this um, sent out to you. Um, small group discovery has been developed by the National Lead Center. Um, I, this is, I worked on this in Tennessee and Kansas um, and Illinois, um, where we developed an approach to uh, a small group going through a discovery process. So these are the resources that came out. There's a facilitator's guide, there's participant workbook, and there's all the, the introduction, the courses are all developed. So you can, you can actually do the workbook online, which is really great during COVID. You can, people can fill it out and go back to it online and it saves and it is secure. Uh, but this helps people understand what their specific employment goal is. Um, and we've seen some great results around peer support. So when people do this process together, um, there's really good um, peer support um, opportunities that come out of that, uh, where they kind of encourage each other and encourage the process and, you know, they're rooting for each other. So um, that's been one of the reasons why we, we have developed small group discovery. But those are the kind of things you can do in, in integrated employment path. Um, the, and also uh, working through career planning workbooks. Um, and this is just one example uh, of one that we'll share with you. The, the slide deck has the links to where you can download these online. So helping, this is one that's very, I, I wrote this back in 2002, believe it or not, it's based on Beth Mount's personal futures planning approach. So it's designed to kind of be engaging, uh, large print and, and good for people to work through. That's something you can do in integrated employment path services. Um, <laughs> uh, so this is the, the rates for integrated employment path. Again, it's a time limited service, but it's meant to develop skills. A uh, one-to-one is $9.40. Um, and one to two is $5.50 per 15 minute unit. This is done by a qualified job coach who also understands the service. It's really important that we train the, the staff delivering these different services about the unique services that they're delivering. What is the expected way of doing it and what's the expected outcome? Um, They'll be a job coach, but they might be doing exploration with one person and this with another person, and then might be coaching people at a job as a third role. So we have to make sure they understand what the difference is and what they're trying to accomplish. There is a one to eight classroom rate here. Um, that um, we learned in another state that this is really helpful for facilitating project search or any kind of similar internship program, because part of that internship program is classroom time. So that's the only reason that we have the one to eight in there. It's only for classroom time. 
uh, curriculum related to like project search or a similar internship program. That's my contact information. Again, this was an overview of the employment services and how we want, want uh, to see them implemented. But I know it's a lot of information I threw at you. So um, the, the whole point of uh, starting small with a small group of providers and a small number of enrollees in the program is that we can work together to do this. Um, and, and if you need assistance that you can reach out and get it. So I don't know if there's any additional comments or I'll turn it back to Harrison.